Oops. Welcome everyone. This is welcome everyone to our third and final conversation in the Center for Humanizing Education and Research summer series. We are so excited to both close out this series and begin our fall 2020 semester with our two brilliant guests, the School of Education Dean Shabnam Koirala Azad and Dr. Ruha Benjamin, Associate Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. Dean Koirala Azad will talk more about, introduce both of them briefly in a minute. Um, so I get the honor to share a little bit about the work of See Her. Um, See Her is the result of much work and much love. It grew out of an idea to uplift and showcase the ongoing work of the School of Education and also to participate um, in the generation, diffusion, and application of humanizing education research that is conducted in solidarity with local and global communities. The center strives to increase institutional and collective capacity to impact public consciousness, policy and practice, and to contribute to ongoing movements towards justice. Especially at this time of converging pandemics, we see the center as a space to gather virtually, to heal, to learn, to think, to, and to engage in critical reflection that's necessary for transformative action and also for dreaming up new possibilities. A little bit about our format for this evening. Um, we will begin with a dialogue between our guests and we'll follow that with a brief Q&A. You'll see that we have the chat that's open for people to comment. Um, you can include your questions, your comments, your affirmations, share love, and everything else on that comment box. But in the spirit of a humanizing framework, please keep your comments relevant and respectful. And what we will do is try and go through some of the questions that have been posted to compile a few to offer to our guests. Um, all tonight's, um, we'll, um, sorry, tonight's conversation will be recorded. And along with the other th um, two conversations that we've had this summer will be sent out to all of you attendees. Um, we give thanks to all of you who are here with us, um, new and returning students, alumni, faculty, colleagues and friends from near and from far. We give thanks to our interpreter who uh, has accompanied us in the first conversation and now is back. Um, and we give thanks to the land we stand on. And we finally, we give thanks to the ability to um, gather virtually to have access to technology during this time when we are all physically apart. Thank you all for joining us. We're super excited for the dialogue we're about to embark on and we're looking forward to gathering your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fuentes, uh, for that wonderful introduction. Um, as Dr. Fuentes mentioned, uh, this, the creation of See Her, the Center for Humanizing Education and Research, is a labor of love. And speaking of love, I am filled with so much love for our guests tonight that these are moments when I yearn to be next to, sitting next to people and hugging and showing that deep respect, love, and affection. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Ruha Benjamin, I wanted to share a few words of thanks. Um, thank you to Lena Onishi, who has been working all this magic behind the scenes um, with the technology and the See Her events. Thanks to our wonderful student, Jory Marshall, for all the beautiful um, uh, flyers for See Her that you've seen the whole series. And thanks to our amazing ASL interpreters, Lisa and Sean, who will be taking turns throughout. Um, this is a beginning of an academic year like no other. <laughs> and here in the School of Education at USF, this is very much the beginning of the semester. We are kicking our semester off tonight. We have our first set of classes 
And so I want to send a really warm welcome to all our students, returning students, new students, our alumni who have joined us this evening, um, and you know, so many folks from the larger community. And we couldn't be more grateful for your participation and involvement in what we hope will continue to be a very dynamic, generative space of learning. Um, and then, of course, I am so, so filled with gratitude for our guest tonight, um, Dr. Ruha Benjamin. Dr. Ruha Benjamin is an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University, where she studies the social dimensions of science, technology, medicine, race and citizenship, knowledge and power. She's also the founder of Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab, which I'm so excited to hear about because talk about taking what you know and creating something completely new and different and affording new generations of students with new opportunities to engage with research and data. I'm so thrilled about that. And she's also a faculty associate in the Center for Information Technology Policy, Program on History of Science, Center for Health and Well-Being, Program on Gender and Sexuality Studies, and the Department of Sociology. And she serves on many executive committees, one of which is the Program in Global Health and Health Policy, and the C Center for Digital Humanities. So, there, it, the list goes on, really. This is just a snippet, a, a small glimpse into all her amazing work in her career. But I think that what I really, really appreciate and love about Ruha is, particularly at this time, um, as Dr. Fuentes mentioned, at a time of these converging pandemics, when we're hearing so much, I find myself specially attracted to people who not only espouse great ideas, but demonstrate it in the way they move in the world. And Ruha is truly that person. You see her speaking at these large conferences with hundreds and hundreds of people. And then when COVID-19 hit, I think Ruha, you were the first person who kind of put it out there. She was like, I'm doing a story session for children. So if any of your kids want to join, <laughs> come on board. That's just one example of so many other humanizing spaces you create in community. Um, and that's just the beauty, I think, of who you are. And in fact, as I was thinking about the start of this academic year, <laughs> and was speaking with a group of our students uh, a little earlier, um, thinking about just everything is happening at the same time right now as we're starting school and working and you know, we have many working professionals who have children and so on. And I was thinking back and really appreciating the fact that I think you are one of the first people who gave me a glimpse into how you could actually move through academia, mm -hmm. higher education, these careers and aspirations as a mother, as a parent. And when I first met you, you were coming to get a PhD in sociology with a toddler, <laughs> with a toddler and as a single, struggling graduate student at the time. I hope you know how much you inspired me because you really took that parenting and mothering and made it such a core part of who you became as a scholar as well. So I just wanted to share that story. And also that toddler that we speak about is now I think in college. So we won't say how long I know that was. But I'm wondering, as we start this session, before we get into it at this, you know, time, wondering if you have any insights for those of us kind of 
going into this year yeah. in this moment. Yeah, so, okay, it, we are not even two minutes into this and you're going to make me cry, but I'm going to figure out a way to do this. Um, so I should say, first of all, how much I love you, Shabnam, and the flip side of that story you told of me landing with my husband, with my toddler in the Bay Area to start grad school was that uh, a couple weeks before we landed, I just put out a call into the to the ether and asked, would anyone pick me up from the airport in the Bay Area, like in my network of friends? And you were the one who responded, you didn't know us. And so to me, that the fact that not only did you show up, you picked us up, you gave us pots, you gave us everything we needed to sort of get, Sean was reminding me tonight, Shabna brought us pots to cook our ramen in. <laughs> so I just want to acknowledge that every story you know there's different versions of the story and the reciprocity of me uh, you know first meeting you in a situation where you were out of you know thin air didn't know us sort of being of service and helping us get our footing when we were trying to start a, a new life i you know that to me is really who you've always been to me and, and I should say, in terms of starting this new, this new year, every single thing that I've been able to do, I've been able to do because there have been people like you in community that have been that, that net, that web. Right now we're calling it pods, right? And so, you know, it, like many things, the pandemic is, is shining a light on both the good and the bad, on all of the things that we have known to be deadly and, and you know, anxiety producing and all of the fault lines are coming to life, but a lot of the ways that people have survived and thrived in our communities, including creating villages in the middle of cities, including creating pods, even if you didn't call it that. Um, so now we're having to be much more deliberate about it out of a matter of survival, but I certainly know that every single hoop I had to jump through for grad school, every different stage of life, I've only been able to do it because of friends, family members, my mom coming to live with us in the, in the village, in the UC village for the first two years of grad school. I would never have been able to do anything if that wouldn't have happened, They're, how very hands-on my husband is. And, you know, just being in community with people. And so I would encourage everyone to get your squad on, get, it, get everything tightened up <laughs> to, get, to get through this. And that it's reciprocal, you know, we give and we get. And that will, that will, that will allow us to do what we have to do. The last thing I'll say is that the beginning of every single semester of graduate school, I would have an anxiety attack. And I would, the weeks before, I would go to sleep grinding my teeth as I tried to look on paper at a schedule that didn't make any sense. <laughs> like, there's no way I could do it. And I, it would, I would, you know, have that panic period. And then once things got going, things fell into place. And then, I, you know, you start to realize, okay, this person has my back. Okay, I can throw the ball over there. Okay, I can put this ball down. And so it was in the doing that, that the realization that I could handle it and that I could let go of what I couldn't handle came into being. But when I just stayed in my head and tried to make sense of how it was all going to work on paper, that produced a lot of anxiety and panic. And so I would just encourage anyone, and I know we're in a heightened stage of that now, this now, much more so than a usual year academic year semester and so i would just encourage everyone to be kind to themselves and to be kind and patient with those around them to give each other some slack and to figure out you know who you're going to help and who's going to help you over the next months and year those are beautiful sentiments that resonate completely so we're here this evening, here to talk about this amazing book by Dr. Ruha Benjamin, Race After Technology. And Ruha, I was just thinking that, 
you know, this book came out in 2019. And did you have any idea at the time that we would become completely technology reliant <laughs> just the year after? Because as I was reading this, I was thinking, this has so much relevance in general, but more so right now as we're so reliant on the different technologies around us. So the, the timing is just amazing. And for us, as we think about going into this semester of teaching and learning, not just ourselves, but our students as well, who are then teaching and learning, um, you know, and so on, such amazing insights in here to ponder. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that Dr. Fuentes said was the creation of See Her was really so that we could contribute to the evolution of thought in education. And the evolution of thought requires us to sit also with what we don't know or what we thought we knew yeah. <laughs> and re-examining that. And you call that out in this book in such an important way. But I'll tell you, when I read this book, I realized, I came out of it thinking, my gosh, I don't know anything. I need to learn so much more. So. <laughs> Thank you for this very important contribution. And I know you have other publications before this that really build on each other. And I'm so grateful for this. Thank but one you. of the things that I really appreciated as soon as I opened the book was how you start the book by really situating yourself in it and telling your readers a little bit about, you know, what brought you to this work? What inspired you to do this work? And you talk about growing up in your grandma's house on Crenshaw Boulevard in LA. And I want to quote you here. Um, you talk about how growing up there, you grew up with a keen sense of being watched and a sense of a collective caught up in a carceral web in which other people's safety and freedom were predicated on, quote, our containment. And I was hoping you could share a little bit with our participants today about this. What, what brought you to this work? Yeah, so thank you for asking me um, about that preface of the book. Um, and so, you know, I was trying to sort of just give the reader a sense of what was animating me to undertake this research. Um, in part, I, I think I needed to wait for this to be my second book because so many of the issues that I wrestle with are, are close to home. And so it was a little too much for me to take on sort of earlier in my career because it requires a little bit of excavation of kind of childhood memories. And, and those don't explicitly figure in the book, but you know, you get a sense that I, I take this research personally. It's not simply an exercise of sort of academic distance. And so when I recall those memories of growing up and being aware of um, the everyday policing of my neighborhood, um, of people I loved, of my neighbors, the kind of, you know, the constant rumble of helicopters, but even more keenly, like driving in the neighborhood and just seeing a random scene of police officers patting boys my age up and down, you know, hands up, down their legs, and just that kind of everyday humiliation that I recognized was not just meant to humiliate them and to um, terrorize them, but it was a more it was a more diffuse effect, that it affects those who, who watch it, it affects those who are friends with them and family members with them. And now I have colleagues actually that do research to show that the impact of policing and incarceration really are, in terms of the embodied effects, are very much diffuse through entire populations and communities. It doesn't only harm and terrorize the individuals who are explicitly targeted. So 
this, you know, it, on the one hand, it's, uh, it's about collective trauma, but on the other, it's a reminder to us that we are connected, right? And so for me in my current work, I'm trying to think about what is the flip side of that dynamic? That is, if we are collectively traumatized, what does collective healing, what does collective justice look like? What does it mean to embody the, the upside of that, right? How do, we, how do we actually use our connections and our, our um, sociality in a proactive way? in the proactive work of healing and world building. And so I guess the last thing I'll say about that, um, you know, is that in, in 2015, my father died and the, it was in part caused by the H1N1 virus. And so part of it is to think about how this little thing, whether it's COVID or H1N1, something that's invisible, is so deadly and we transmit it without even knowing right it's reminding us of our sociality of our connection and so it reminds us that small things can be powerful yes deadly but it can also be life affirming and so how do we actually begin to deliberately use this technology of connection and by technology i'm not talking about software and hardware but i'm talking about our social technologies our relationships our community building our networks and kinship how do we use that to transmit um, the kinds of things we need to survive and to and to affirm life and so these are just some of the ramblings um, that sort of link my my biography, my childhood, my personal experiences with my intellectual pursuits. It's beautiful. And I think, I, I know that's just a part of the story too. The, I, I love the many stories that have brought you to all these areas of work, but also again, like I said before, the beautiful coherence with who you are. Um, so, what I loved about what you just said is that, you know, there's a place for really examining the many, many, many deficiencies and fragments of our current social order. Um, and then <laughs> what do we do with that knowledge? And how do we move past? And I think your book does that so beautifully in a way where it, it gives a model for how we can start to think like this, going from that, you know, a social critique that's really necessary to understand the most insidious ways in which inequities are reproduced, but then moving us to a place where also thinking about, well, then what power do we gain from that as we create these new possibilities. So I'm excited to go through that with you in this yeah. um, book, but it's done so beautifully. And if I can just share a quick anecdote about where, like I was beginning to do it, but it sort of crystallized for me and became much more deliberate. That is pairing the critique with a creative sort of a vision of where we go. <laughs> Um, so what happened was in uh, the edited volume that also came out last year, it's called Captivating Technology, in which I brought together a number of colleagues to think through these issues of race and technology and imagination in a number of different contexts that I couldn't do by myself. So in this edited volume, and we were towards the end of that process, and I was sort of um, bouncing around ideas for the title of that volume. And the title that I had was really not good. One of the reviewers were like, everything else about this volume is good, but that title has to go. So I sent out some titles to the team, to the, the contributors. And one of the more senior colleagues um, who contributed to that wrote back and said, you know, um, in, in the titles here that you're, you're suggesting, it really articulates the problems that we're writing against, but um, you're ceding too much of the intellectual space to the problem and not enough to what world you want to build and what you want to envision. And it's that way of framing it that really hit me is that I'm seeding the space, the intellectual space or the air 
to naming the problem, which is vital. We know that it's important to be able to name what's hurting us and what's killing us as a first step in order to refute it <laughs> and to counteract it. But when we only stay in that mode of refutation, that only stay in that mode of naming what we don't want, we never get around to actually naming what we want, again, as a first step in order to create it. And so when he um, shared that sort of reflect, mirrored back to me what I was doing in the titling, it made me go back both in terms of naming of that volume, but also in adding the subtitle to the book you have in your hand, which is Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code. That is giving name to what we need to counteract this form of discriminatory design. And that's just crystallized for me, something that I try to build both in my research, but also especially in my teaching. Because any of you who are in the classroom, you know, if we only sort of pile on the articles and books and films that are showing how terrible everything is, it just, you know, it gets to a point where, yes, it's satisfying to, be, to see your reality mirrored, but also we have to breathe sort of life and hope and energy for the movements that we need in order to actually address those issues. And I think too often we at, smuggle it in right at the very end <laughs> rather than carving out as much or even more space for those kind of conversations and intellectual engagement as we do with the diagnosis. That's wonderful and so perfectly fits into this vision for the Center for Humanizing Education and Research as well. You st start the book with this concept of coded inequities or, or everyday coding. And I know that you also mentioned that you borrow um, from Michelle Alexander's uh, The New Jim Crow. Uh, where she is shining a light on the prison industrial complex, mass incarceration, especially of Black people in this United States, where there seems to be a deepening caste system almost. Um, and then you, you know, bring this to th that sense to technology and the pervasiveness of it in society in ways that perhaps we don't even see in our everyday use of various technologies and in the way we are in the world. And I'm wondering, um, what is the new Jim Code? Yeah, thank you for that question. And so I should say that um, before I answer the definition of that, I, I just want to frame it in terms of what I'm in conversation with. Yes, certainly Michelle Alexander um, and sort of riffing off of that um, framework, um, but also really thinking about the way that many of us are socialized to think about inequity and race. Um, and, you know, probably not the folks on this particular call, but in terms of the general discourse, it's still very much racism is framed as both interpersonal, uh, growing out of the kind of, you know, willful intent to harm and demean. Um, it's often sort of cast as an aberration or a glitch to business as usual. So when something is tagged racist, it's seen like, oh, that's an anomaly. Let's deal with that. It's a bad apple rather than the entire orchard. And so when we begin to think through a critical race um, approach to technology and science, then we have to actually flip that and understand that racism in many ways is productive. It produces things. It's not good, not in the normative sense, but racism produces things. It produces wealth. It produces status. It produces, you know, institutions, <laughs> you know, all kinds of things that are central to the, the current order are generated not only by racism, but also by other intersecting forms of domination. But that's a different way of thinking about how it operates. And once we begin to reframe racism as productive um, of things, even as, it, as it's harming people, even as it's deadly, so it's the simultaneity, then we have to understand that technology becomes technology now in the, in the more narrow sense, innovation, automation, AI, it 
the default settings of these emerging technologies are um, embedded with racism in terms of the biases and the ideologies and the worldviews and the data that's being drawn from historical processes. And so in that case, it becomes much less surprising to notice all of the examples of discriminatory design that I outlined because it's kind of like, of course that would be the case. Of course the soap dispensers don't work on darker skin. Of course the facial recognition can't detect darker skin individuals. Or of course it tends to surveil, predictive policing tends to surveil be focused on black communities, et cetera, et cetera. So we can go down a long list. And so the new Jim Code is naming that simultaneity of innovation and social containment. The fact that these are not, it's not a paradox. It's not like, oh, these two things funnily you know, work together. It's that innovation is producing new forms of containment, but what makes it even more dangerous than the types of racism that we associate with the past that are still ongoing um, is that it's hidden. The new Jim Code is hidden behind a veneer of neutrality. So when a doctor goes to the computer and gets a risk score for a patient that tells them, oh, this person doesn't get this ventilator. Um, it's not, because it's coming through a computer screen, it goes unquestioned and it's harder to hold accountable. It's different than if a doctor who's clearly racist is saying, you don't get that ventilator. But when an algorithm is the mediator of that decision, it becomes much more harder to keep track of and to hold accountable and people don't know how to then identify it. So it, I'll, I'll, I'll end by just saying, by kind of coining this idea of the new Jim Code, it's just a starting point of, of naming something that's widespread, diffuse, making decisions about our lives in ways that we don't even recognize, whether it's whether someone's going to get paroled or not, get a good health treatment or not, get a job. In, you know, for those who may be paying attention to Twitter right now in the UK, one of the things that's happening in the context of education is that the A-levels, um, the, the scores for A-levels were generated by an algorithm because students couldn't take the test. And predictably, predictably, schools that were more elite, the algorithm produced much higher scores for those students and lower scores for the students that were coming from less resource schools. And so the students didn't sit for the test. The algorithm predicted based on, on past kind of a, gen, a, a whole host of, of variables. And then now there's a, you know, a huge controversy around this algorithmically produced educational outcome, which we could have seen coming. And so the, the issue is we shouldn't be outsourcing these important decisions to technologies and software systems that are learning from the past and that past has been deeply discriminatory. Thank you for that example. And also I mean, there's so many amazing examples in this book of this idea of um, <clears throat> coded inequities. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I really appreciate the tangible examples you have so we can see as we read these big concepts how it actually takes place. But I also appreciate um, you naming that part of the issue here is that this broader guiding economic framework always puts profit over people. And uh, you quote actually one of my favorite authors, Arundhati Roy, who talks about this as well, that the economic ideology dominates discourse. And we know that discourse um, is really related to how we think and our thoughts are connected to actions, attitudes, and the stuff we create. And so that the, the naming of this, the, the economic framework, this engine that kind of rules how yeah. we think is really um, critical. I think but within that, what really blew my mind was where you lift up the fact that with technology, profit maximizing is often rebranded as bias minimizing. Mm -hmm. 
And so, um, you know, that this sometimes takes the form of, you know, we think about this as advancement, for example, the, the, the concept of advancement, yeah. or the concept of progress, and how it's related to these notions of moving us forward. But clearly, we're missing so much when we're buying into that framework, the yeah. paradigm. And I want to get into the concept of benevolence that yeah. you bring up as well. But um, I'm wondering, you know, what are we missing when we're just going along with these larger frameworks that really yeah. frame our thought, our behavior, our choices, and so on? Yeah. yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really related to the point um, of profit maximization and bias minimization going hand in hand is that it's really not enough for those who monopolize resources and power to just do so. They need an ideology of justification in order to sort of wrap themselves and to cloak themselves. And so, you know, th this is going back to my sort of sociology, Weberian roots in which you can't just dominate like in the raw, you have to have a, a you have to feel that you deserve to dominate. <laughs> and one of the discourses that creates that ideological justification, especially with respect to the hegemony of Silicon Valley and the tech industry is that every single thing, no matter how minuscule, has to be wrapped in the notion that it's going to help and better the world. <laughs> and so if in this moment we've sort of come to a shared, loosely shared consensus that part of bettering the world is to minimize bias, to do diversity and inclusion, then every single product that comes out, every single new sort of thing in some way is going to use that language and to say that this is one of the ends to which you can put this new app or this new automated decision system um, is that it's going to address bias. And this happens especially, it happens across in many different contexts. But if we just take employment, for example, so many new companies on the, on the horizon, hundreds of companies really, that claim to get, help get us around the employment discrimination by creating AI-powered systems in which I would sit in front of a screen like I'm doing now and talk to the little green light and an answer the interview questions. And the system will take hundreds of data points, my posture, my vocal tone, my eye contact, my accent, many, many cues, and then it would take my data and compare it to those of existing top performing employees at a given company. Now, considering, let's say, a given company is 85% male or six, you know, 70% white, or et cetera, then that means that I'm being compared, but using this media of AI to this existing pool, but it's all sort of covered in this veneer of data-driven talent decisions. And so many of these companies promise not only to lower the workload of human resources departments, but they also promise to reduce bias because noting that human beings make, you know, discriminatory decisions when they're, um, you know, uh, uh, judging people in the context of school or work, et cetera, and the, uh, the illusion is that human beings didn't create this system <laughs> and the data that's being used to train it has not been generated by prior human practices. And so again, this is one of those ways in which the language of bias, the language of diversity is just so easily um, integrated into old into systems that reproduce the same old, same old, right? And so that's why we have to pierce through the rhetoric of tech utopianism. We have to spit out the Kool-Aid that's being generated for us when it comes to technology. And it doesn't require us to be anti-technology, but it has to, it means that we become more wiser stewards <laughs> of technology and that we, in, we in really explode who is creating this in terms of right now, a narrow sliver of humanity is behind the screen, is deciding what's good for all of us. And one of the ways I describe that is that many people are living inside of someone else's imagination when we use these media. 
And so the question is, whose imagination will continue to shape the future? And we have to actually recoup a much more democratic and participatory process in which this narrow sliver of humanity is no longer allowed to monopolize, not just resources, not just status, but a monopolize the imaginative terrain by which we then materialize all of the things that then are the tools of everyday life. And so um, we can't get distracted or buy into the, the rhetoric of, um, that we have, especially now post George Floyd with all of the companies putting out statements. We have to really look beneath the hood, behind the screen and see what's actually happening despite all the rhetoric and the intent. I really appreciate the shining of light on that specific phenomenon and then kind of taking this idea even of advancement and, and progress and, and all these uh, kind of terms that we, we've gotten used to and taking it to this place where, um, and I love the concept of imagination, so we'll definitely come back to that. <laughs> Not to holding on to that. Um, but as we think about, I, I think what I really appreciated, one mind-opening part of this book for me was that we're offered sometimes these tools as an act of benevolence. Um, and really the part that really got me was uh, your examples of you know, families in detention centers at the border, for instance, or um, uh, people who are incarcerated and the use of electro electronic monitors um, mm -hmm. and the idea that somehow by giving someone a mon one of these electronic monitors, there's, there's a pseudo sense of freedom, I think you mm -hmm. say, that it moves people, oh, you know, you have some freedom but how that really just increasingly catches us in this web. Yeah, um, so absolutely. I, I wonder and if you could say a little. I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's part of, one way to understand it is, you know, we're, we, you know, we are in a culture that fetishizes choice, right? Choices. And that's, you know, especially market choices is conflated with freedom. And so we're, presented choices, you can either sit in this cage or you can be let out and you can be on this electronic shackle, you know? And in that universe, in that imaginary, one of those options is clearly for many people, it seems, okay, that's, that's probably the better option. Um, and it, the choice is presented in a benevolent manner. This is the more humanizing approach to punishment. And you see there the language of a humanizing. It so easily continues to do violence by other means. Mm -hmm. And so the question we always have to be asking is what choices are being left out of the frame? If we had a real choice, what would we actually choose? We would choose to abolish these institutions of racial and social control and find other more transformative ways in order to hold our one another accountable, et cetera, et cetera. And we can go down that rabbit hole. But the question is always like within these dualities, these choices, one may be better, but to call that true benevolence, you know, or to call that really like the humanistic option is to, be, is to drink that Kool-Aid. And it's always the one who's posing the, the option that has the real power. And so we didn't have a hand in actually creating the options and the choices then we are still subject to the governing logic, to the, the monopolizing force of those who are producing these options for us and then telling us to choose. And so I think that the electronic monitoring is one definite arena. We can also, I mean, you know, in terms of education, there's many ways we can think about the false choices that are presented. You either do it like this or like this, <laughs> and you had no hand in deciding between how, you know, what are the available choices. And, and so it's really part of, again, thinking about how do we expand the universe of possibles mm -hmm. by which human beings get to actually make authentic choices and have true 
sort of autonomy and agency in our lives and thinking about that as a collective process rather than as the fetishization of individual choice and options. What's good for me? Who cares what's good for you? And so th these are some of the, the sort of um, thoughts connected to that example of techno benevolence. Thank you so much. Um... Folks, if it looks like I'm melting, it's because the Bay Area is going through a major heat wave and I'm feeling it, feeling it like many others, I'm sure here. So please drink water and stay hydrated. Um, but um, back to this, again, this uh, very important, I feel like, uh, you know, issue you raise, which I think we go through even in our graduate work. So speaking to our students where we often kind of think about, you know, what's my research design going to be or what, what am I going to do? And then thinking within that about objectivity and neutrality and all these kind of different dimensions of, of then how we not only design ideas, but then how we, how we do it. Yeah. And um, so you talk about, you know, the the problematic kind of nature of objectivity and and uh, neutrality in the way it's sold essentially um but also then how you know we often just you know that whole saying the ends justify the means that that, that it's so prevalent and that really we what we really need is to be paying attention to the means so mm -hmm. If there's absolutely. anything more yeah. about yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one, one really concrete illustration of this tension between ends and means um, arose uh, last fall in the wake of, um, you know, technology companies finally sort of saying, okay, we need, to, we need to pay attention to these issues of inclusion and diversity, specifically around the research that came out by jo, jo, uh, Joy Bulamwini and Tim, Timnit Gebru around facial re recognition systems that are used uh, in many different arenas, but have a, a fundamental flaw when it comes to detecting individuals who are darker skin and routinely misgender black women in particular. So initially many of these companies rejected that and said, oh, the research is flawed and it wasn't flawed and they finally had to wrestle with it. And so when Google was coming out with its new Pixel 4 phone, it wanted its phone to work in an inclusive manner to be able to, when you, you know, open the phone with your face, it wanted that process not to be sort of, um, uh, bungled in terms of uh, darker skin people not being able to do it. So they hired contract workers in Atlanta to approach black people, black people who were homeless at the time, um, and gave, gave them $5 gift cards in order to take a selfie so that their faces would be in the data, training data to teach Google's phones how to detect darker skin. Now this, this chain of events from Google deciding, okay, we want our phones to be inclusive to hiring contract workers, to the contract workers approaching people, but also feeling something is amiss, something about this means is not right. And eventually going to the media and saying, this is happening, we were told to, to do this and we think something's wrong with it, um, is an interesting case in which the ends to be inclusive was built on a coercive process that in many ways echoed prior um, examples of scientific and technological experimentation on the backs of vulnerable communities. And so for me, there's a lot to think about with this example, including, is my um, audio going out? No, Are you okay? Okay. Um, in terms of who was in that room, making that decision like and didn't have wasn't privy to how this was going to look and how it was going to play out um and specifically not telling the individuals who were taking their selfies what this was for so withholding that information but all in the name of some good end right we need this data we need these faces in order to make this product work well and so this is an example where the means are are just as important at the ends. It should not have been a coercive process. People, that information should not have been withheld, but even more importantly, perhaps, is that this very same system that's gonna become better at detecting darker faces is likely 
maybe not in the context of Google's phones, but in terms of facial recognition systems more broadly, going to be weaponized against these very same people who are being co-conscripted in order to make this product inclusive. And so this is a, an example of what my colleague Kianga Yamada Taylor and Louise Simster in different contexts call predatory inclusion. That is, inclusion is not a straightforward good. Diversity is not a straightforward good. Plantations were diverse. And so we have to always be thinking about power. We have to be thinking about what is just in the process, not, as on, not only what's inclusive in the outcome. And that, I think, it, it requires us to be much more vigilant about the, the social relations that underpin any process of technological development or even educational development in terms of the kinds of tools that we develop to sort of use in our educational system, that the process is vital. Absolutely. And hearing you talk about power, one of the things I often grapple with is just this need to even redefine how we understand power as something to be accumulated versus something that perhaps can be diffused to others. And so as I think about power, and I was looking at the time, I could talk to you for hours. Um, but uh, as I was thinking about this, it brought me to this part about a uh, part in your book where you talk about then these abolitionist possibilities or retooling some society and reimagining justice. And here we are headed into a brand new academic year. And we'd love to get some insights on how, you know, how do we orient ourselves in this way, especially at this time of converging pandemics where we know that change is just urgently needed. And so um, few things that I just thought were gems. There's so many gems in this book. We could be here all night. But <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the really interesting things was you talk about how even the word abolition includes roots that mean both destroy and grow. And it reminds me of a former guest of ours, Dr. Bettina Love, who talks about oh. abolitionist tools for teaching and you know, often would bring that up. Like, as we think about the issues, then what is it that we're gonna have? Once this system crumbles, what are we gonna have to yeah. stand on that's different? Um, and then also this, um, direct quote from your book that says, calls for abolition are never simply about bringing harmful systems to an end, but also envisioning new systems mm -hmm. with an emancipatory ethos. Mm -hmm. Love that, with an emancipatory ethos. Mm -hmm. And you quote activist and educator, um, Maryam Kaba, who says, hope is a discipline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Beyond code switching, um, you, you call our attention to the fact that we need to rewrite codes. And mm -hmm. this is true for technology, but perhaps, you know, when you talk about technology, it resonates with so many aspects of society where mm -hmm. the assumptions are just embedded. Um, and, you know, a call to embed new values, new social relations into the world and you even call our attention to the need for moral imagination. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can um, yeah. kind of end this portion with your insights on that so that we can just keep these concepts in mind as we think about our work of both addressing some of the grief and difficulties of this moment, but also then imagining something new. Yeah, thank you for that. And and, um, you know, I, I, I could go on and on, and I want to also be cognizant of time, and I don't know if we're still trying to get questions, um, but I'll give like a nutshell version of that, sort of riffing off of that. You know, this language that I'm using in the book, both the language about coding and the conversation around abolition and growing and destroying, I think one of the things I just want to leave people with is really um, coming down from the kind of lofty language 
and um, and the, even the talk of imagination, it tends to be very sort of in the air and diffuse and sort of everywhere. And I, and I really want us to think as we move into this year about the nitty gritty, the fine print, the things that are small, the things where no one is looking. It's not on the website. It's not on the front page of the syllabus. You're not gonna get an award for it. <laughs> no one will know. <laughs> and all of the things that are behind the scenes, in part because so much violence happens there when not, no one is looking, you know, so much power is wielded in the Excel sheets of city budgets deciding which schools get what resources, you know, like in the in the little columns of Excel sheets, <laughs> there's so much power and violence wielded in the mundane and the banal kind of bureaucracy of evil, as one scholar put it, with respect to the way that data was weaponized during the Holocaust. And so if it is the case that so much happens in that small print, then I think that is also where we have to put our attention. Rather than big gestures where everyone will know that we did something for Black lives, how do we actually mirror forth and see the Black and Latinx and disabled and indigenous children, the poor kids, like, you know, all the queer kids, how do we actually do it in small ways that are in reality magnified in the hearts and minds of both our students. And really, when we think about what actually shaped us for good and bad, so much happens with a side glance or with a warm look. And so I, I want us to think about how systems are built through this, the, these small, the small buildup of matter, right? So when we talk about Black Lives Matter, let's look at black matter. Let's look at dark matter. Let's look at what's invisible. And let's put our attention there in terms of what we want to change and, and infuse with love and justice. It might be you know, things that we take off the syllabus and put on. It might be actually spending the class checking in with everyone to see how you're doing rather than diving right into the material. It might be before things even get started, sending around uh, you know, some kind of check-in survey that let your students know that you're thinking of them not just as kind of people who you're going to grade, but as people who you care about in terms of their well-being, what they need in terms of these platforms, you know, screens off or on, you know, being introvert or extrovert, kind of really thinking about how we operationalize an ethic of care um, in our virtual classrooms. And I'm happy to actually drop some links in the chat for people who've done this work, you know, people who've been teaching online, um, many of you perhaps for, you know, for many years who now we need to learn from um, in terms of how they've actually worked to build that into, um, into these interfaces. And so that's, that's what I want us to just think about in terms of coding is how things that are small and seemingly unimportant are actually quite quite important and where we can pour our attention. That sounds like probably the most doable way to approach this work. And I really appreciate you bringing it um, from these big concepts and ideas to really, you know, what is that space of influence that we have and how can we start to do this work and practice that emancipatory ethos, that concept I love. That's a beautiful, beautiful idea. Um, so I'm going to try and segue here into some of the questions. Um, I'm gonna, I'm looking here and there's one um, question here that says, I'm wondering if Dr. Benjamin has any insights for how caregivers protect and engage for schooling in the digital footprint of black indigenous and brown children. Can you say that again or just rephrase it for me how you understand sure. it? Um, it sounds like uh, for school caregivers protect and engage for schooling in the digital footprint of black, indigenous, and brown. Um, this is a question from Victoria. Victoria, if you want to clarify in chat, we, I just want to make sure we 
really understand the question. And maybe I can come back to that. Just quickly, I'm chiming in here because Lena and I are going to send a couple of different questions for you also. So maybe Victoria, you could do that question first and then we'll send you a few. Great. Thank you so much. Well, while we're waiting for the questions to be collated, <laughs> I want to say, um, Ruha, that just reading this book, um, increased so much my appreciation, <laughs> again, for you as a scholar, but really this scholar who's humanizing much of what's often seems so inaccessible. And one of the things I really appreciated about this work is how you say that technology often seems like, you know, it's taking us to this place of post-human, like you know, <laughs> that, that it's really just, we're beyond that, that, yeah. that, you know, we have more effective, efficient systems. And you name this, and you know, we've done this a lot in the creation of this, this center, really thinking about when we say humanizing, what do we mean? Mm -hmm. And I think you bring to light the distinctions, you know, that post-human mm -hmm. assumes that everyone's had a chance to be human. Mm -hmm. And the distinctions even in that yeah. kind of understanding of humanity. So yeah. I really appreciate that in the evolution even of our center in considering all those dimensions yeah. of what humanizing means. Yeah, and I think I'm influenced for those who perhaps haven't checked out her scholarship i'm influenced uh, by sylvia winter who one of the 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 ways that she describes sort of the 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 stories we tell about humanity she says that there are different genres of the human and i love that phrase genres of the human like different ways of talking about and being human and she doesn't stop there she says that one particular genre, one particular story has dominated the story of man and the man. <laughs> we, can, we can infer what that story is. And it's a story, one of homo economicus. That is the human being as primarily material, but biological, but also driven primarily by the desire to accumulate. Yes. And so, when we talk about being human, I think it's worthwhile to do exactly what you all are doing, you know, at the center, which is really not taking for granted that we're all talking about the same thing, that there are different competing genres of humanity. And one of the things we have to be much more explicit about is, is demoting that dominant genre that has really overshadowed all other ways of being human. And we have to resuscitate other ways of being. And she says, Sylvia Winter says, hu human is not a noun, it's a verb, it's a, it's a practice, it's a way of being in the world. And we have, to, we have to sort of demote that dominant way of exercising power over others in place of a much more horizontal mode of power where my power doesn't require you to be subordinate where we can coexist, where our power sort of is shared. And so in all of these ways, I think we have to elaborate different stories about what it means to be human and more importantly, the practices that go along with those stories. So when we say humanizing the future, we don't want all versions of humanity to proliferate. That dominating, accumulating, settler sort of way of being colonizing the future, we have to really refute it. And we have to put it in its place and say, your time is done. <laughs> you, you, had, you, know, you got to tell your story. You got to be human, the man in the world in that very um, exhaustive way that pushes everyone and everything else to the side. And we have to allow many more versions, many more genres and, and ways of being in the world to proliferate. And we have to be very deliberate about that and not sort of um, 
fall back on one very narrow notion of what it means to exercise our humanity and to humanize education, humanize the future. Because, you know, um, anyway, I could, go, I could go on, but check out Sylvia Winter's work and think about, I think, think about what story we're telling mm -hmm. about the, the relationship of education to um, our, our well-being as human beings. You could speak more about this and I could listen to you all night. So we'll do that separately after, <laughs> after this is over. Um, all right. One question is that we seem to be in great need of a new technology, one that will move us through this evolutionary phase where love is our guide. We have not been open to that truth. Where does love fit in? into the technology of this new time? Yeah, thank you for that question. And, and I think I also often use the language of new when I really mean new old. <laughs> uh, that is to say, again, thinking about what kinds of technologies, social technologies, spiritual technologies have been um, shut down and been pushed to the side. And so when we talk about a new technology, of infusing love and an ethic of care. It's not brand new because there are many communities and cultures that have kept that going, even though it's been sort of demoted and it's been denigrated and been seen as not scholarly and not objective and all of the things that demote it in, in status. And so I think what we have to actually think about is how to, how to, um, resuscitate, how to fan, how to water um, these ways of being and educating and relating to one another that are not brand new, that our, that our grandmothers knew. And, I, and in the context of healthcare, for example, you know, one of the sort of paradoxes, and it's not a paradox when you really understand how, you know, when you refute the, the notion that technology equals um, progress, but the more sort of technologically driven that our, our healthcare has become, especially in the context of childbirth, you know, there, there are times when we need the high tech surgeries, we need the cutting edge experimental, et cetera. But when we think about this thing that people have done since that we've been people and the very short time span in which it's become technologized and been sort of taken into the hands of a, a small sort of, um, profession in terms of childbirth, and we realize, and we look at the stats in terms of the well-being of people birthing people, the well-being of babies, that has not gone hand in hand with the greater technological prowess that has come to wield, um, uh, you know, obstetrics. And so the new technology in this case would be, let's actually put doulas and midwives back in charge <laughs> of childbirth. And yes, there may be occasion in certain cases where we have to do that, that surgery, but the current status quo is that that, that has become the norm um, in terms of intervening when really we could have our, have our practitioners who've been passing down this knowledge from generation to generation take a much more powerful central role, which is interesting because their role is one of accompaniment. It's one of actually engendering and empowering the birthing people to actually be more active in the process. So power in a midwifery model is not monopolizing power, but it's actually empowering people to actually do what they have to do. And so that's just one arena in which we can begin to see that what the new thing is, is actually something that's much older, <laughs> that we need to actually water and we need to, to we give, give the resources and the, and, the, and the legitimacy to grow and to expand and to become much more common. So I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. And you mentioned that in the book too, which I appreciated so much is that we don't always have to think of newness, <laughs> that right. there's so much existing. Exactly. That, that, exactly. And Ruha, the part that really made me chuckle was you, you give the example of this, you know, someone from a, a design school we won't name, who, you know, came up with this idea of the perfect classroom, or, you know, this is how you have, this is the design for this uh, perfect learning environment. 
and of course I'm paraphrasing, but this veteran educator who comes forth and says, that's, I've been saying that since 1968, quoting, quoting Paulo Freire. So yes, um, I really appreciate that as well. You know, what, what do we have? And, and the stakes right now are so high because what a crisis like COVID does, it creates an opening, not only an opening for us to do more mutual aid, to be more, you know, to build our community power, et cetera, but also an opening for those who wield power and technology to step into the mix. So we have someone like Gates going and partnering with Como in, in New York and saying, don't worry, leave the education up to us. We'll implement all of these learning platforms. You don't have to worry about it. And so this is a, the, the idea that, you know, we fetishize newness and we fetishize, you know, a sort of technological fix for something that really we have to start with the relationships and building up from that. And in, in some cases, we might want to use some technology, we might not. But again, going back to how we started the conversation, real power is being able to decide when and how and if we want to employ some kind of new tool. Um, but in many cases, what we have to actually grow and water is are the relationships between educators and students. And we don't need Gates money to do that. Right. I'm going to go back now to speaking of veteran amazing educators, back to Victoria's question, um, where she says, um, I think her question mainly had to do with how do we protect BIPOC children and their digital foot footprint now in this moment when virtual schooling is making them especially vulnerable across digital spaces, um, photos, videos, etc. And so I think that's the dimension she's looking at as yeah. caregivers. How do we really pay attention to that? Yeah, that's a really big, important question. And the answer is multidimensional, but I will say it's really, there's no real good way to do it as individuals and try to monitor what indiv our individual kids are doing. It's something where, for example, I had to write to the, you know, the information technology office of the university and say, this new learning platform, who owns the data? And can they access the data of the students? And can they sell it? And who's surveilling what? And it has, so it, we have to actually go to the source of the, the, the platforms that are being used. So if in your school, they're using a, you know, learning management software, um, the parents in the community need to be asking questions about the surveillance processes and also the data, ca the, 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 the capitalistic surveillance capitalism uh, enfolded in it. And the fact that, you know, for there was a week a few months ago where the Zoom, uh, Zoom announced that people who use Zoom for free, Zoom was, uh, you know, had the prerogative to give, give whatever we did on Zoom to law enforcement. <laughs> If you paid for Zoom, then your data was protected. But there was a week there and people, there was a huge backlash, you know, in which people said, no, this is ridiculous. First of all, no one's, no one's data, Zoom data should be accessible to law enforcement. But then you can create this two tier process, which tells us, you know, that it's important, but to not share it, but only those who can pay will get uh, be afforded that. And so that's an example within a week of Zoom then doing a complete turnaround and saying, okay, 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 we won't, we won't do that. But we have to stay on it because they often tell us one thing and then do another. But the whole point is that that was a collective process of saying we refuse to use this if this is how you're gonna operate. And likewise, when it comes to students and schools, you know, it's really hard to think about, you know, what an individual parent can do. There are some things, but I really want to encourage us to think about how we need to organize collectively and hold our, our schools and our institutions accountable for the various technologies that they adopt and, you know, over the next year and much longer. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, there's a, I think there are a few questions around this idea of how do we retool technology? How do we, how do we right. do this? How do we repurpose technology so that there are benefits uh, or, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, to minimize the harm mm -hmm. or, 
or you know, eliminate the harm is the ideal kind of idea. But uh, how do we do that? How do we retool? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, you know, there's, there's different ways to think about. One is a technology that already exists, is widely used, and is difficult to pull back. So retooling in that case would be about kind of harm minimization and actually auditing that the way that that technology is used to figure out what the various forms of discrimination are. And then, for example, figuring out how to change the algorithm and how to give to use different training data in order to change the outcomes. And so there are individuals and groups working on that front of auditing algorithms, which I talk a little bit about in the book. And kind of minimizing harm, but also litigating algorithms. There's a whole group of legal scholars who, when these big sort of automated systems create, wreak havoc on people's lives as they already have, for example, in Michigan, the state of Michigan adopted a system that was meant to flag individuals that were engaged in unemployment fraud and flagged thousands of residents of Michigan and people lost their homes, they got a criminal record, they got divorced, they committed suicide because of this particular, you know, particularly egregious process. And we find out like a year or more later that this Midas system, this automated system was actually um, making mistakes in like 95% of the cases. And it was just a matter of the wrong data or the wrong entry in particular forms that created this outcome. So there's a class action lawsuit in that case that's taking the state to task for using this. That's just one example of people who are, who are sort of working for justice and, and with these data, these data tools. But for me, what's more interesting and important is not just the reactive types of examples, but the more proactive in the building and designing of various systems and technologies? How do we actually embed different values? And for that, and again, I'm going to give you the nutshell version. For that, it actually, the process actually begins before any coding begins, before any design processes begin. It begins with the question that we ask and the way that problems are framed. And too often, the problems are framed in a way that make problem people, as Du Bois would say. They, they cast the question and say, let's figure out why these youth are at risk. Let's figure out why these people are not, you know, are not, uh, why they are violating their parole. Let's figure out why these people keep getting sick, <laughs> right? And so you see in every case, the question is posed down to the most vulnerable, those who are trying to navigate unjust and inequitable systems producing data about them, predicting their risk, surveilling them. So the way that all of these digital tools and systems are directed in terms of not just the tool, but the question that's being asked, that's being solved by these technologies right. are already reproducing this, this, this way of thinking of, of individuals, racialized poor people as the problem. So then that means if we want to begin to subvert that and change that status quo, we have to ask different questions. Rather than asking why individuals are at risk, let's talk about and let's produce data about those institutions and organizations and people who are producing risk for the rest of us. Right. So for example, the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, which actually has a, a great website, you can look at the data on San Francisco Francisco, rather than looking at the riskiness of renters <laughs> that would allow landlords to decide, oh, I'm not going to rent to them or I'm going to rent to them, it's producing data about landlords and property owners and saying, let's look at how they're actually mistreating and not, not keeping up their buildings and throwing people out. So you see how the lens is directed at those who create this precarity and instability. So the anti-eviction mapping project is just one of a number of examples in which people are using data tools. They're collecting data, creating visualizations that can be used by movements and by activists in order to hold powerful institutions accountable and powerful people accountable. So to the question, it's, it begins with the questions that we ask and in, through which framework we're actually sort of thinking about problems and understanding how power already infects 
the questions that we ask. And so the anti-eviction mapping project, and also you can go to the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab, which is a new a center that I, that I founded at Princeton that connects students, researchers, artists, and activists. And if you go to the, the tools page of the Just Data Lab, so just the justdatalab.com backslash tools, you'll see 10 different examples of these Just Data tools that students created in partnership with community over the summer around racism and COVID. And that will also give you a sense of how we can design differently. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. And for bringing our attention to these possibilities, because I think as we see these examples, we, it, it inspires us to new possibilities. And I wanted to point out that there was a message here in chat that said the anti-eviction mapping project was created by a USF grad. So, hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also uh, a big shout out here to our students, um, Igosa and Gertrude, who really, when COVID-19 hit, utilized the platforms available in a different way and created a school called Making Us Matter. And I think the mission statement, I'm paraphrasing, but is, to humanize and centralize blackness for high school students. And so um, that's been a beautiful thing to see the evolution of our radical parenting group at the School of Ed that's trying to figure out how to support parents during this time. And of course, this is just the beginning of a semester when I think that these um, imaginings, in the big sense and in the small sense of what's possible, yeah. our, the, the portal is just opening up for us. And Dr. Ruha Benjamin, I could not think of a better way for us to be inspired to do this work ahead of us, to look at possibilities. And thank you so much for spending time with us, for inspiring us, for share, sharing your knowledge and wisdom. And I really hope that you'll come back and accept our invitation where we're, when we're actually able to be in person. Absolutely. So you can meet the community. We can truly be in physical community and appreciate 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 you so much and absolutely it's really my pleasure my honor thank you everyone who hung on this friday evening call you guys are amazing and i want to give a special shout out to these these interpreters they are giving me yeah. life this whole time i couldn't take my eyes off them so thank you you all and shabnam john thank you so much for inviting me thanks everyone thank you all big shout out to Lisa and Sean, thank you so much. It's hot and you're, you know, interpreting for us this whole time. Thank you. Thank you. And to our students, have a wonderful semester. I look forward to engaging with you more. And thank you all again for joining us this evening and stay tuned for other See Her events through this fall. Thank I love you. it. Take Good night. <laughs>